Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to a very dark and windy Juma Private Game Reserve. Hello, my name is Steve. I'm joined by Cam on camera. We're out and about in what is a very miserable looking morning, but hopefully we're going to brighten it up with some fantastic animals on this Friday morning. Hello, everybody. Welcome on board. It rained in the night. It's still potentially raining. There's a lot of wind and conditions are quite similar to yesterday morning. So let's go out and see what we can find. Don't forget everyone, this is a lovely interactive experience. If you have any questions and comments, please do send them through on the app. You can also join the conversation using the hashtag Wild Earth on Twitter, or you can watch us on the YouTube chat stream, get involved there. It's myself and Cedric out and about on Juma, and then Andrew down in Amakala. Sure, it's one of those mornings where <laughs> you don't know what you could find. It is potentially one of those mornings anything could be out and about. But um, as we saw yesterday, most things were pretty well hidden. I don't even think we saw elephants yesterday morning. Lots of tracks. Oh, we did. We saw elephants briefly, but we didn't manage to, to broadcast them. Happy birthday, Anna Marie. Happy birthday, Anna Marie. Well, we'd love to find you some spotted kitties. I really would. I really would like to find you something. Something with a heartbeat would be nice. But on top of that, we're going to be continuing some discussions today on ecology because I feel like it's one of those topics that can be dealt with in any kind of weather pattern or weather condition. Yesterday we had excitement when we started because uh, there was some really interesting activity around our camp that we were following up on. But unfortunately we didn't manage to come across much. Maya Zotis, good morning to you as well. Good morning to you and everybody else on this lovely Friday morning. It's been an interesting week of weather. And the cloud blocks out the sun, makes it very dark. Notice we are in the infrared for now. I was sawing on the dam cam last night. I don't know who that could have been. I know Cedric is following up in that area. But uh, it is windy with a chance of rain. Let's go see how accurate my weather predictions are. Yes, it is a very windy morning and uh, the wind is howling at uh, this uh, present time, but I'm sure it is going to subside uh, shortly around here at uh, Juma Private Game Reserve in Zabi Sand, South Africa. Good morning, everybody. My name is Cedric and behind the camera with me here on Arusty, we've got the one and only, the man with a plan behind the cam, it's Muscles and Paul. Yes, so I'm here at Chilapan at the moment. I'm just going to hang around at Chilapan. Uh, it's a nice little pan that is pretty much between our camp and going south towards the southern boundary. It's really halfway. And somebody mentioned that they saw some, um, or not saw, heard some uh, leopards calling or a leopard calling uh, during the night. I think the last one was about quarter past ten, but it wasn't too close. So I'm going to take a look around here in the Mulawati drainage line just to see if we pick up on anything. But I might actually just sit here for a little bit just to listen out. That's how we found Tlalumba yesterday afternoon. Actually, we were doing a plant segment. The next moment we heard a rasping just to the south of us. And we went to go and follow up and we found Tlalumba 
calling quite a bit. It's here. Good morning. You say you are ready for a furs furry Friday, feline Friday. All right, maybe like furry feline Friday. <laughs> we'll try to get there. Furry feline. Oh, it is feline Friday. So yes, let's see. Let's see. Let's see if we can get some cats again this morning. You hear a, a black cuckoo in the distance. I don't think we can actually hear it on on the ambient. Yeah, see, I think the reason for that, I don't think... Uh, yes, we can hear it, Jared, uh, black cuckoo. Sorry, I just... I just heard Jared saying black cuckoo. Uh, yes, we can hear it. Can't see it. Can hear it. Oh, okay, can't hear it. Yeah, I think you know why? Because the wind. And so what's happening now? That's why I'm going to go a little bit further south. If you heard uh, a leopard calling on a dam cam, the, the camera's uh, mic is very sensitive, and uh, the wind is coming from south to north. So if that leopard was calling, maybe towards. That was my stomach. That was my tummy, sorry, poor, <laughs> poor, got, uh, poor, got, poor, poor got very excited there, but my tummy was growling <laughs> so early in the morning, uh, that's funny, that's why I'm going to go further down towards Twin Dams, we're going to take a look there. Right, well, we're going to sit just to listen out a little bit longer around the side or, you know, scratch around here in the, in the Mulawati, the drainage line. Uh, I think let's head over to Amakala in the Eastern Cape as Oster Andrew wants to say good morning to everybody. Good day everybody, a very nice good morning from South Africa to all of you here at Amakala Game Reserve on a nice clear day. Seems like today is going to be beautiful with some nice clear skies and some really nice warm sun. A little bit different to that of Juma, I believe uh, they got some, uh, some gloomy and rainy weather this morning. So good luck to you guys out there. Hello everyone, morning, my name's Andrew and that's Morgan behind the camera. Yeah, this plan this morning is, oh, we're not too sure what the plan is. We're just gonna play it by ear this morning. Maybe we come across some elephants in the dune thicket this morning. We're not sure exactly where they would have gone yesterday, but that's all good. Uh, we'll find something cool to look at. Now I heard the lions roaring uh, this morning. It was a little bit tricky to tell where they were. The sound was sort of uh, you know, very difficult to pinpoint. So we just drive these dune thicket areas, maybe we come across them. And uh, yeah, I just got a nice update from one of the chaps from Bush Lodge yesterday that uh, the buffalo herd went by their lodge and had a drink of water and gave birth right in front of the lodge. And I didn't know this until you know, after drive. But uh, apparently one of the buffaloes was trying to kill the young calf that was just born and the other adults came running in, in the calf's defense. Um, that must have been quite a, an interaction to watch. Now we did find the buffalo this morning, just they are in a signal uh, place where we don't get signal. So we unfortunately and sadly had to leave them. But no worries, we're going to head off into these dune thickets. We're going to scout around a bit about here and then uh, head off maybe towards the eastern part in the open areas and uh, just check those those sites. Dung beetle, correct. Oh, this is the, the best time of the day in my Once, they dominated the earth. Now, they are frequently despised, persecuted, and hounded.
Reptiles and amphibians play a hugely important role in our planet's ecology. They represent an evolutionary memory. A reminder of our own fragility. That the Anthropocene is surely a blink of evolutionary time. They may no longer dominate, but reptiles and amphibians remain a crucial and fascinating cog in the Earth's biological systems. Well, sorry about that, everybody. We do have some difficulty sometimes broadcasting live from these wild locations. We just found a male leopard track there coming down this road, but sadly heading straight towards our southern boundary. It's not very nice of of this leopard to pop in and just go out again but let's go have a look if it does indeed cross out and then we'll carry on from there heading straight down here earthside it's the bugs it's the rain it's the wind bits of branch and tree and leaf <laughs> and dust now yeah, these tracks are heading straight south here on top of all the elephants on top of the rain male leopard I can't tell you if it's Moati or tortoise pan although this is a very common area for TP Nice big footprint. Life is more colorful with a zebra by your side. Join us as we celebrate one of Africa's most distinctive mammals on World Zebra Day. Revisit our greatest sightings whilst we spot all things black and white on safari. Grace. Strength. Resilience. Stay tuned and connect with nature. I don't see anything here. No leopard. No leopard tracks there. We're coming straight towards this boundary, so I'm going to check that fire break. 
the road just back here. Problem is it still heads towards the west. Still heads away from Juma. Oh, that's my footprint. Okay, let's carry on. You know, the chances of coming this way down and then that way again are normally pretty slim. Not impossible though. Dung beetle, all of them will walk on the car tracks. The uh, only difference really is that the predators, the territorial predators, they use the, the vehicle tracks as if they're game paths to mark territory after rain. Um, it's essentially like a big game path. They'll use it for walking quite quickly to uh, cover their, cover as much space as they can in the shortest period possible. So these game paths are very much like, or these po these tracks are very much like game paths for them. Other animals will walk. We've got wildebeest and zebra walking in and out of Juma along these as well because it's a little bit more open. Um, the rhino will follow them, elephant will follow them. Hmm, it's very tricky to see tracks over here. Just go down our firebreaker. I mean, the firebreaker it doesn't even look like a road anymore. It doesn't even look like a road anymore. So I don't think he would have turned there. Oh, we'll give it a shot. Drive down it for a little bit. Russell, I don't know if I struggle with any tracks. I think in certain weather conditions we struggle to follow tracks. But identifying tracks, okay. Time of year, season, and the vegetation is as dense as it is now and the ground as hard as it is now. Tracking is very difficult. Tracking is very difficult now. I mean, being this close to the southern boundary, I would assume that this leopard is crossed out. But assumptions, you know what they say about assumptions. Yes, this is a road, everybody. It's a fire break road. Has not been checked for some time. Okay, well Cedric said he was going to stick around Chelapan for a little while. Let's go see if he's still over there. Thank you, Steve. Okay, so I'm not too sure exactly where Steve is. The firebreak is very big, um, the southern boundary, so I just heard the southern boundary. I've got a feeling he must have been coming down Weaver's Nest. I'm trying to work out, yeah, he must have been coming down Weaver's Nest. And uh, well, we are at Twin Dams at the moment. Just going to listen out, look out around this side and see if we get lucky. If he's coming, if he's going to hit the firebreak and he does come west, that male leopard starts, I'm not coming west, if he comes east from, if, if I think, I know Steve is at this point of time. 
You might head towards some more whitey, maybe towards Ledwood Road where we had Clalumba yesterday afternoon, that female leopard. But we'll keep our eyes, our ears peeled while we are sitting here with some Egyptian Erush. A pair of them, yeah. Not noisy at all this morning. Uh, keeping nice and quiet for now until there's another Egyptian geese that's coming over, flying by. Then you'll find that these two will all of a sudden act quite territorial and chase after that individual or that other pair. But for now, it's just the two of them. No, uh, Yannicka, no, look, if you're territorial, you're territorial. I don't think you can be more territorial than, than and less territorial. If you're territorial, you're territorial. So, uh, um, but also, you're looking at all territorial birds. I mean, if you look at birds of prey, for instance, look at fish eagles. So, let me just mention the fish eagles. I mean, you, fish eagle, if you've got a pair of fish eagles that's hanging around like there at Chitwood Dam, you'll never really see another pair coming through that side. They are. I think their territory maybe stretches out a little bit larger compared to Egyptian geese. Egyptian geese, if you look at looking at them around Crocodile River area, there's thousands of them, thousands of them along the river uh, bed there on uh, the southern side of Kruger National Park. And I mean, it's I stayed there for many years, and we always every morning and evening and afternoon you just hear Egyptian geese going crazy. It's almost deafening. Um, but yeah, you know, if you've got a small little water body, I think they don't really want any other members to come this side. Oh, wind is still blowing away here. Howling away. I do apologize if you get any wind noise at the moment. I'm trying to duck and dive out of this white, uh, out of this wind. We're gonna go that side. I might end up heading towards Ledwood Road where we had Lalamba. Just quickly gonna do a bit of a follow up there. You never know, she might still be in that area. So I'll be here for another little minute and then I am gonna move on. While the morning is still young and early and fresh, I think it's always the best time to start looking out for nocturnal animals This January, Wild Earth is commemorating birthday by showing off our feathers. Watch Safari Live and join our naturalists for a weekend of birding. Catch up with the flock as we try to spot the birds migrating back to Europe at the end of summer. Enjoy the wilderness through a new eye with our bird bowl. Wild Earth, connecting with nature.
Okay, myself and Morgan, we've just come out the dune thicket and one of the plants that we see quite nicely and quite commonly in these dune thickets is a, is a spiky one over here called a needle bush. And you can see it growing very well here and it's almost as if it's just doing so well that it's just surviving and surviving and surviving. And there's a reason why it's doing so well. So I'm just going to break a branch here. So I just want to choose a branch that's not doing too well. Um, that way we're not you know disturbing the plant and destroying good branches i think this one's going to be a good one so we'll just snip it off nice and gently with the plier oh man it's not the most easiest one to snip i'm just going to put that on the ground but let's take a look at this i'm going to hold it just like so and you can see those thorns quite nicely there can't you but what's interesting is you know these leaves which are very palatable you can see it growing out over there and then just behind this leaf are two thorns can you see that all right so i'll just let it go up again so a browser a leaf eater might fancy this plant it comes along here and tries to bite that leaf but now it's going to get poked in the lip by this thorn over here and i'm not quite sure what is inside this thorn but it does leave a bit of a sensation on the on the skin when getting pricked um, and i've pricked my finger now and i can already feel the sensation but um, yeah, the needle bush is the name, but another name is called a bee sting bush because often when you walk past this plant, it feels and it pokes you, it feels like you've been stung by an insect of sort. So another name for it is a bee sting bush. But now there is a use for this plant and it might be a little bit gruesome for some, but I'm going to demonstrate something. And if any of you are sensitive to me putting needles in my skin, please look away now. All right, so let's demonstrate. Okay, so let's do it now. Got to find a nice thorn with a nice sharp end, like a needle. So these will do. Yeah, boy. Just gonna just take a few of these. Let's do three. Okay, let's do four for luck. Yeah, those will do. Okay, I'm gonna put this branch down and we're left with these needle-like thorns. See that? Very, very sharp at the end. All right, let's begin. Let's begin. <laughs> Andrew, you ready for this? I hope so. Okay, so what you do now in the Bushman times to access their pressure points because, you know, um, acupuncture is a very medicinal thing, apparently, and it can sort all sorts of things out. But you can take a needle and it doesn't really hurt. Um, you mustn't go too deep. You must just do just a little bit. So what you do is you find the pressure points. I don't know where they are. So you just go toop and then it'll stick in. I didn't even feel that. But if you go too deep, of course you are gonna feel it. There's another one there. Another one there. That one I felt. And a little bit there. <laughs> I'm sure some of you are like, no way, this is not nice. Look at that. <laughs> Gary, there's a bit of a sensation. I don't know if it's poisonous, but uh, you do feel a bit of a sensation. And it does have a bit of a numbing feeling. Um, a local anesthetic and that's another use for this plant. It was used as a local anesthetic back in the day um, But it's not poisonous or anything like that. Otherwise, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't put this in my skin But yeah to access pressure points um, This was used as acupuncture needles by the bushman back in the day But now if you have a look because I've just put them beneath the soil I don't know if there's like a little barb at the end of it But if I shake it maybe one or two will fall out But if I shake my my hand like this you can see they just don't want to come out and if I pull one out, it pulls the skin a little bit. So it's almost like there's a bar of sorts. It just doesn't want to come out. Let me just turn my... F Maybe you can see that. See there? It just doesn't want to come out. Alistair, acupuncture, yeah. Imagine I do hit a pressure point and then something happens. <laughs> I'm not a, I don't know what... What these pressure points do, obviously doctors and that, that, that they know, but acupuncture has been practiced for almost 700 years. It was originally invented by the Chinese and apparently a very medicinal thing. Um, it can help all sorts of things like pain and other things, I'm not quite sure. But yeah, these are the needles from a needle bush used as acupuncture. Look at that. Now I'm just going to remove them and you'll see if, if once I remove them, there's no blood that comes out. See there. I'm just gonna 
pull my skin tight, absolutely zero blood coming out. <laughs> power of plants. Giddy up, you are quite right. The power of plants. Yes, I totally agree with you. I think plants are an amazing thing. And I think, you know, if we could learn more medicinally about plants, wow, I think uh, we could sort out a lot of things. But now I'm just listening very carefully. I can hear some zebras alarm calling. Hear this whoop, 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 whoop. I'm just wondering if the lions didn't come down this way because it's not too far from that area where they were last seen um, a, what, a day day ago or yesterday. I'd pick up my Leatherman, otherwise I leave it behind and that's no good. All right, so that was a cool little plant segment we did there. Right, let's go back to Steve. He's on the move now. Let's go see what's happening. Thanks, Andrew. Good luck with your zebra alarm calling. Well, we haven't found any tracks of that male leopard crossing out. These impala look pretty relaxed, considering it's so windy. It's a little bit jumpy, to be honest, but that's just the conditions. because I haven't found tracks of this male leopard crossing out doesn't mean he hasn't crossed out. I'm by no means an expert tracker. They can often walk on areas that are a little bit more compacted and you just don't see the tracks. Hello Impala. You definitely were the stars of the show yesterday morning. Okay, so you notice this is a male impala there, and behind is a female impala. So the sexual dimorphism in impalas is males are slightly larger and uh, they have horns. And we spoke a lot about ecology yesterday, and the females don't have horns because they don't compete with each other. Hence why there's no horns on the female. But yet some species of antelope, the females have got horns. The reason for that being is that with the male impala, they have horns for fighting amongst themselves, for dominance, for mating rights. The females don't compete with each other and their ability to run away and hide is their predator avoidance strategy. The flooding of the market with the babies is also their strategy for survival, as they are sort of woodland thicket type of species as you'll find with most of our woodland thicket species. The males have horns, the females don't, because, well, it's a disadvantage having these cumbersome things on your head if you don't need them. Using the shelter and the cover of the bush to save yourself and to save your babies. So when you see male and female have horns, generally you can associate them with being more open plains animals where they don't have the luxury of being able to conceal and hide their youngsters and the females have horns so as to protect their youngsters against predators. So male and pile have horns it is an intraspecific competition to compete with other male and pile. Other female antelope including buffalo have horns for interspecific competition against predation. I hope those words make sense to you. The pilots will do a lot of grazing this time of year. They will also feed on some forbs and some trees, but a lot of the green, juicy, growing grass is what's being favoured by most animals right now. Cheats is the other animals. We did have an elephant very briefly while we were trying to find our male leopard, but he didn't stick around very long. Let us also sort of search that area a little bit. Maybe elephant was a little bit skittish because of a cat, but we didn't see anything. 
What do you guys see? Now the nasal alarm call that impart us. Oh, there's a hyena. I know hyena. It's a wildebeest about to join the scene. He's about to join. It's going to be in the scene in the moment. Monkey Boo Boo, as far as I'm aware, they've got uh, specialized teeth for grooming. Most animals will like to groom themselves, but Impala got a very specialized tooth structure. Here we go. These are the three boys I think we've seen the other day. They're not very happy. See, both male and female wildebeest will have horns. Females for defense and competing with against the predators. It's not the ideal habitat, the wildebeest, these dense woodland areas. One of the reasons I was talking the other day about habitat management and conservation, open areas. There used to be much larger herds of wildebeest and zebra in this part of the world, but due to the incorporation of water, bush encroachment is a reality and bush density has removed a lot of the very nice open areas that would have once occurred, once upon a time, occurred naturally in these areas. And once you reach a certain point, you have to physically remove the trees. The brindled blue canoe. A lot goes on behind the scenes of a safari. Sign up to be an explorer and get exclusive access to Behind the Safari. Sit back, relax, and take a deep breath. Learn more about the Wild Earth team. I would not normally keep it on the dashboard, but I'm going to show it to you there. Come along for the surprises and chaos. Download the Wild Earth app today. Wild Earth, connecting with nature. But how nice having some zebras once again here at Juma. As you can see, all of these uh, virtual zebras are very happy to see us. As you can see, they are wagging their tails. And uh, so happy seeing Paul and myself approaching this cut line. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. They're just using their tails to swat away all the insects, all the flies in that. And that's making sure that uh, they're not going to get irritated by them. But how nice it's, uh, is it to have virtual zebras again? We haven't had virtual zebras for a long time around here. Uh, 
And usually sometimes you'll find winter time, you'll see more of them around the open clearings and the, around on Juma, but uh, summertime, it seems like there's enough grass all over the show and they'll go to those big open plains south of Juma, maybe on towards Chitwa area and now uh, yeah, on the fire break. So we are on the eastern side of uh, the property at the moment. Nice to see these animals. One, two, three, four. Four of them there. It's amazing if you look at those typical with the Birchall's zebra. They have this typical, how can I say, shadow stripe between the black stripes. And they're in all good condition. Fantastic condition. As you can see as well, with the black and white stripes, they, they don't really mind being in the big open clearings when it's nice and hot because those stripes help them quite a bit. Black absorbs, white reflects. With black and white, black and white. It creates like a nice wind thermal above them and they don't have to look for any shade. But they don't need to look for that anyway this afternoon or this morning as it is uh, still very cool, cloudy. <coughs> so they're not too bothered about any sun. Each one's stripes is different, just like a fingerprint. So all each one's very unique. You'll never get uh, two zebras that have the same pattern. <coughs> oh, Zane, it's very difficult to see one's pregnant. Maybe like just by might be a little bit bigger the female if she's pregnant compared uh, with uh, Gassy. Maybe I said the teats might be a giveaway. Now you can see the one that's walking away from us. That's a female. Very got a thick black line under the tail. Very, very, very thick. All right. Oh, all right. Let's go to Andrew in Amakala. He's got some lions. Ah, oh, thanks Cedric. I hear the excitement in your voice for us here at Amakala Game Reserve. We've just found these lions and it's so interesting how we found them. So we found their footprints nice and deep in the soil. And uh, I said to Morgan, let's do a track and sign segment. So I thought, okay, let's get out. But before we get out, let's just properly look around here. And then I saw them behind me and the steam coming out of their mouths. So I did not get out the vehicle, of course. All right, so they've come to one of the pans here. They've had a drink of water and they seem to be incredibly active. Oh, there's some red hearted beasts coming straight towards them. Okay, let's just watch here. They're in full stalk mode now. Now bear in mind that there are some red hearted beasts walking straight towards these lions now. And the lions are in a lying down position and others are stalking. So something could happen here. If any of you are sensitive, please take note of that. Okay, it seems like the red hearted beast has already spotted them. Oh man, look at this. There's a bit of a charge going. Red hearted beast scattering off. All right. Oh man, this is so interesting. So you should get some red heart to beast in view now and you can see the sort of the antelopes that they they're interested in there they are Anna Marie yeah the Amakala pride doing us good this morning oh they've been doing us good the last few days and by the way Anna Marie a big happy birthday to you from all of us uh, in the Wild Earth team and all the animals of the bushveld, we wish you a very wonderful day. I hope you get some nice presents from your loved ones. This is our present to you. It's 
So the element of surprise is totally gone. So yeah, <laughs> I think this lion is more curious than anything now. I don't think it's going to be able to hunt anything when these antelopes are fully aware. Because the whole idea about lions being really successful in their hunts is having that element of surprise. Hence the reason why they do well at hunting at night. When it's dark and nothing can see them that well. <laughs> oh man, this is cool. What a screenshot that'll be. <laughs> oh, let's just lay down there, check them out. Dark main lover. <laughs> oh, this is a, a start to a good weekend. That's it. Oh man, this is great. We actually heard lions roaring this morning and it sounded like it could have been Amakala's lions. Um, I don't think it was these ones. I think it was the adult male in the pride. I'm not sure where they are, but it does seem like they've split and the adults don't seem to be here. It's just these, uh, these juvenile lions. Or sub adults. Let's not call them juveniles, let's call them sub adults. <laughs> Man, this is cool. These red hearted beasts are shifting all over the show. And you see the hearted beasts are actually quite smart. They've gone onto that slightly elevated piece of land. It's normal for them to do that. Yeah, look at these two having a good time playing. Oh, just got smacked in the face. Yep, they've been doing this uh, since we've been watching them. They've been running all over the show, jumping on each other. Look at that one line has totally disappeared. Gives you a good appreciation for how they can conceal their bodies in even some shorter grass. Oh, well, this grass is fairly long. <laughs> you just see the tail flick. Very fascinating. Yeah, I love watching lions when they're so active like this. And that's why morning safaris and afternoon safaris are so popular, uh, is because animals are most active, you know, during those times, you know, depending on species. But during the, 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 the heat of the day, like, you know, midday, it's not the ideal time for a safari because it's hot, it's warm. Some of the animals are resting, laying down. I come early morning, very good time. Do you yearn for a seamless and tranquil connection to nature? <coughs> Download the Wild Earth app and become an explorer to enjoy ad-free viewing. Stay tuned into your favorite shows and enjoy the sights and sounds of nature uninterrupted. Explorer subscriptions are available monthly, biannually, and yearly. Sign up today. Wild Earth. Connecting with nature.
patience here is what pays off. He wants to come back to the road. Many times I've tracked him and then suddenly you lose the tracks and you go forward and then you turn around and there he is again. It's a typical behavior of a cat. It doesn't want to be seen. Just go off the road, crouch down, carry on. With a lot of space he's fine. Prairie dog, well, I hope you got to see his tail at least. <laughs> That's more than we showed you last week when we found him. Molwati. Possible he's gone a little bit further forward already and we've missed him. It's also possible he's just sitting in here waiting for me to, to go away. hasn't come out here. Yeah. He will. Tony, I uh, don't know why he's so skittish. I mean, it happens. Leopards that haven't been reared in an environment where there's habituation can be very very skittish but you know James Richard sent me pictures of of Mawati as a cub and I mean he had a relaxed mother I don't know I think he's just he's just that that cat how's that can you get down the road there is that not going to work for you can all right yeah. that going to work eh? okay okay I mean, apparently he comes from a relaxed environment but you know, every animal has got their own behavior. And Mawati exhibits typical behavior of a non-relaxed cat. You know, in the darkness, at night time, their behavior is very different. Most cats are. If you ever are habituating an animal, a leopard or lion, it's very easy to do so after dark because they have a very different attitude. They know darkness is their friend. But in the daytime, a different switch gets pulled and they behave very differently if they're not relaxed. But even if they are relaxed, there's a different element to their behavior night and day. So we're just going to sit here and maybe he'll pop out again on the road. Norm, no, we're not that close actually. We're not that close to where Columba was. We're on Shabama Road, which is, is quite far west. This is about as west as he goes. You go to the end of this road and you'll cut up towards Zoe's Road. That's the western sort of section. But, you know, the tracks we had before we're coming from this general direction so whether he's doing a loop or whether the other tracks were tortoise pan I can't tell you we found a male leopard and that was what we were searching for it just happens to be the one and only Mawati the ghost dominant male of the central parts of Juma he's a big boy I still can't believe the other day when I put that poll out about Mawati and Tortoise Pan, if, theoretically speaking, they had to get into a, 
a ring and have a boxing match. 51% of the audience said Tortoise Pan would win. 49% Mawati. I find that surprising. I think he is a beast of a cat. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with TP. I think Mawati is bigger. So everybody, at 7 o'clock Central African time on the 21st of January, there will be a town hall with Emily, Andre and James. This will be open to everybody. Twenty-first of January, seven o'clock Central African time. Seven PM Central African time. Okay, well the ghost has done what the ghost does best and he's given us a slip. There are a couple of little game paths from where he went in that would bring him around us and towards the the access road there to Treehouse Dam. You know, when he's on the move like that, he's not going to sit around and wait very long. He's going to keep moving, and even if that means walking in some relatively wet grass, he'll do so. Did you hear what Laura said there? Sorry, Jared, I didn't quite... Um, Hear what Laura said about this leopard. Elusive, yes, Laura, that's why we call him the ghost. <clears throat> and we just stopped to stretch the legs and as we got back on the car. We both saw him at the same time. I wasn't quite sure what I was seeing. But I was like, what's that? Cam's like a leopard. I love that sound. He's in the road. He's busy scent marking. He probably come walking from, from the other side. And so we were stationary for a few minutes. So he probably didn't hear us. And then in typical Mulwati style, he just went off the road. <laughs> we went in, came around. And he was back on the road. He did that twice, so it's typical of him. Anyway, we're going to keep trying. We'll go around to Treehouse Dam, see if maybe he pops out. But it sounds like Cedric has made his way to Bubblesook Dam. Let's send you back over there. Nice. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thanks to Philosophy Pose. I'm busy saying good morning to everybody. But yeah, nice, uh, Steve-O. Sounds like you almost have had another oh my word moment there. Uh, luckily, luckily Cam had his eyes open. But yeah, we are at a beautiful dam here far on the northeastern corner of Juma. A beautiful dam known as Biffelzook Dam. And we've got a nice pod of hippos all of a sudden yeah and it's nice oh <laughs> did you see that <laughs> i was doing like that spiral almost in the water that was quite uh entertaining like that what you call it that water gym gymnast you know and they do that funny water dancing stuff anyway uh, <laughs> pause just looks at me funny again <laughs> but yeah nice to have this uh, pot of hippos here at Bifflesuk Dam. Looks like they've decided to make their way back here. Ah, that's it, synchronized swimming. Thank you so, so much, Jared. Synchronized swimming. <laughs> this one, I'm putting the poles in the way. Pull now. Oh, that's all right, we might get some. It's coming back this way again. They're all up and down. 
<laughs> they are so busy here this morning, these hippos. Once again, it looks like we've got about seven, eight of them here. I love sometimes when they're here at the dam and they are so active, it becomes so entertaining. As well as we had that female with a calf, yeah. I can't see, see her. No, Rodney, no. If the grass is scarce, no, I don't. Herbie, wars won't really fight. You know, for the for the grass and all that. It's just, it's. Uh, I don't think that's like in uh, their nature. When you're looking at something as uh, predators, you know, predators is predators. That's just in their nature to compete against one another, even if there's plenty of food around. But uh, you know, herbivores not as much. Maybe hippos. I think if it comes to something that's going to fight for, you know, grasses and all that, maybe hippos, because hippos are territorial. They even more kind of territorial over the little sections inside of these blocks where there's nice uh, grass for them to feed on. But uh, I've never really seen them fighting over grass. It's more males fighting each other for females. Oh, and this dam is so full and so deep. It's amazing. That, I think that's why these zippers are coming back quite a bit here to the Wilfelsick Dam because this dam is holding water so well. It's so deep and it's got nice little areas where they can go in, come in and out of the water. So it's a perfect little spot for them. Oh, water ballet. Elizabeth, yeah, that is uh, water ballet. Ballet? What ballet? Is that what does her? I think it was. Yeah, I must be right. Yeah, I must be ballet. 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 Hmm. All coming to greet us this side. I'm hoping for maybe some tawny cats around, yeah? That's what I'll do. I'm going to continue going west along Bifflesook boundary. And we're going to see if we can find something that side. But yeah, we're talking about uh, lions and all that. Let's head over to Andrew to see what's happening with those tawny cats in Amakala. Uh, thanks, Cedric. Yeah, we've uh, <laughs> we've been spending some time with these lions here. Oh man, what a cool day it has been! All right, so I said earlier that it looked like one of the adult females was with the pride here. It doesn't look like that. It's all the the, the sub adults here. And it seems that they've been left here. But as we sit here, we can still hear the zebra's alarm calling in the distance. So we think the adults are not too far away. These red hearted beasts are getting so irritated by these lions over here because they just keep on walking towards them. And they're still young, these lions, so they're still um, a little bit inexperienced. There's a few calves within this uh, this group of red hartebeest and yeah, we know with any predator they are really attracted to calves and the old and the injured and, and those things. So I've got no doubt that they've got their eyes on one of the calves. But the adult red hartebeest are doing a good job at herding the group away from these lions. Hey, good morning, pangolins galore. It's a good day for lions. And I see, I was just thinking now, you know, um, Steve managed to find Moloati at more or less the same time that we found these lions, which is so cool. Um, two naturalists in two different locations, simultaneously finding species of cats. I think that's pretty awesome.
so we're seeing those lions now um that's a nice little sort of elevated piece of land and the red hearted beast ran straight for that elevated piece of land they're not there anymore now because the lions are there but it's such a clever tactic for any prey animal is to get higher than your predator so that you can watch them you can see exactly what's going on and you've got a little bit of an advantage and uh yeah, having that advantage could be the difference between either the predator, you know, catching the prey, or the prey managing to survive and herd themselves away because of that advantage. So, yeah, advantages, uh, it's a very important thing to have that element of advantage. Yeah, you might just hear my sunglasses case unzip now. I'm just going to wipe our monitor so that myself and Morgan can see and get some of that dust off. There we go, good as new. I think a good idea would be just to spend some time with them this morning and they are sort of just by themselves as the the sub adults and just to spend time with them to see how they're doing things jade that's uh more or less right yeah morgan uh 14 15 months old that sounds about right so i need to do september i would say you're you're almost right there So they still got some time to be with the adults. Uh, the books describe them to, you know, staying with the adults for two years, sometimes up to two and a half years. And by that stage, um, hopefully they've uh, mastered the basics of hunting. And uh, yeah, they are fully equipped and ready. Um, and then, you know, the adult females can then give birth again or get pregnant again and give birth again after these youngsters have gotten to a certain age, around about two, two and a half years. Twenty twenty four is here, and it's sure to be our best year yet. Come along and join us on the twenty first of January for a company update town hall that's open to all registered viewers. We will update our viewers on where we are, discuss what's to come in the new year, and answer any questions. Watch it live on the Wild Earth app. Wild Earth, connecting with nature.
<clears throat> so of course in in most cases you know the weaponry the sexual weaponry the horns the antlers is heavily male biased and uh, cross resulting from the growing of the horns the maintaining of them the wielding of them is suffered by the male of course and so they they studied um, differences in a number of in, in four different families and they noticed they found that there was definitely increase in the, the size of the brain the females when the males had large elaborate defense mechanisms or fighting mechanisms Always new studies, always new science, always new learning. Thank you, Judy. Okay, these young lions are very, very active this morning. Uh, they seem to be, you know, stalking each other and walking all over the show here in these open environments here, which is very, very nice for what we do. <laughs> and so cool. So this is a cool sighting. Red Hartebeest, they decided to really get out the area and they ran behind us and they on the opposite elevated, elevated area to where these lions are. Is that Sandy? Uh, Morgan actually had a comment this morning that uh, it's almost like they, they're trying to irritate these red hartebees so much so until they eventually catch one. Um, and like the red hartebees might think, oh no, these lions are not serious, we don't need to pay attention, and the lions catch one. <laughs> oh, it's, that's Sam. Okay, thanks very much, Jared. <laughs> and I think the red hartebees are super annoyed this morning. They are not in a good mood being chased all over the show here. <laughs> An irritation hunt. Now, where are they going now? Well, it seems like they are lying on the top there, but they might go into that more wooded area up there. I'm just glad that we got them when we did because we did call it in on the main radio, which is broadcast to all the other lodges. And uh, two of two vehicles have managed to come and join us here. So it's nice that we can share the sighting and contribute as well. They help us a lot by finding things, and this is where we help them back. I'm hoping they're gonna maybe lie down there and just, you know, just enjoy that open area at the top there. Otherwise, if they go into that wooded area... Yvette? Mm. You can, I mean, very unhealthy lions are not, not going to have a very healthy looking mane. Um, but then healthy lions that are eating frequently, yeah, the mane is nice and thick. And it uh, looks like it's been brushed and nice and shiny. But it's an interesting one that's in one of these other game reserves that I, I was at. I got to see a male lion, an adult male lion, who um, wasn't doing too well in that area and facing too much competition and was just struggling along and he lost the whole mane. It's almost like he was a lioness with no mane. Um, it's the first time I've ever seen a, a maneless lion. Sadly that lion did uh, face severe competition and pass away from, from lack of condition and it was in another game reserve that I visited once. And then someone uh, sent, sent a comment in. Dawn, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, where did that come from? Dawn, they're not hungry at all. No, they've been well fed. Uh, oh, they've eaten all sorts of things. And Morgan, I think, has had probably the one of the really fascinating sightings and something you don't often see. And that was this pride of lion catching a bush pig. I've only seen bush pig like two or three times times on Amakala. 
You don't see them often. They're shy. They usually come out at night. And uh, yeah, Morgan and Steve, uh, um, Chris saw all the action. But they've just recently had an Eland kill and it was a full grown Eland bull. <clears throat> And just by judging by the look of the, the hind quarter of that Elan bull, it was probably like a 700 kilogram animal that they had a few days ago. So for a pride of seven, oh, that's a good meal. Seems like they're disappearing off the top there. We might just need a, need to try and reposition Yeah. All right, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to try and reposition. We're going to send you back to Steve. He's on the move at the moment. Andrew, well, we're just giving it one more chance here yeah? on the road that Milwati was walking up. Just uh, one little look. Nice and slowly. I'd like to get his the Milwati look for you on camera. We we get it. But then it goes. <clears throat> Getting the Moati look alive is not easy. Gotta give him lots of space. He's probably already walked past us now, but <laughs> we can try. We can try. So this is a road that both Tingana and Hukumuri used to walk on. Essentially Tortoise Pan has taken Hukumuri's territory and Moati has taken Tingana's territory. Hannah, you obviously know the face. He's got such a teddy bear face, doesn't he? But a look that could kill. He's got such a look about him. He's a very characteristic leopard, by the way he looks at you. But when he wants to disappear, he is very good at doing that. This vegetation is perfectly suited to swallow a herd of elephant. Did you hear that? Um, Something pays off, I don't know what. Norm, patience pays off, I'm guessing you're saying. Persistence pays off. Well, we did get him, and I think those of you watching got to see a tip of his tail. Um, <laughs> you won't be able to identify him very well from that, but we got a good look at his face. Hmm. Somewhere around here. But uh, a lot of little link roads through to Treehouse, which we were at just before. Might have taken one of them. He might also have just decided he's walked enough for today and he's going to slink down. He 
Lily the ghost, indeed he is the ghost. I think I do miss Tingana for that. Tingana the male leopard of previous years. If you found his tracks, you would find him. Generally, you would find him. He was a, a very easy leopard to track. Okumuri as well. Tortoise pan is tricky to track because he covers such a large distance. And then Mawati, well, he just goes off the road and then you can't find him. Nurture your connection with nature with our weekly newsletter. Become an explorer and receive the latest word from the wild in your inbox. Catch up with your favorite Wild Earth characters. Watch the week's memorable wildlife encounters. Stay up to date with the happenings and what to expect from Wild Earth. Sign up today and get the best seats on the largest safari vehicle in the world. Wild Earth. Connecting with nature. Okay, so we're heading towards a bit of vegetation now. Uh, yo, Morgan, did, did we hear those zebras calling up here? Or do you think it was more down there? Okay, everyone, you know that thunder's a bit of a no-no for us. I'm a... Oh, it's attacking, attacking the monitor lizard. Oh, let's just watch this play out. Oh, she's trying to protect her babies. <laughs> Shook the birds out of it. <laughs> He's going to push this whole tree over. Casual. And look how he's looking at us. Guys, that is unbelievable. Well, you're back with us, everybody. No changes this side. Just doing a loop around the block. 
come in towards Treehouse Dam from another angle. He came from from the fire break, from where we were. So I'm I'm assuming it's the same animal. So invariably he is going to be going more east. He's done a loop all the way around and going to be cutting. So very nice to to know that Mawati is on the property, but just keeping up with him is a different story altogether. So he's on his far western trajectory, he was anyway. Darren, yes, well you should. <clears throat> You should. The problem is, is that um, because there are some very relaxed cats in the Sabi Sand, most people hear there's a leopard and they just drive in like it's, yeah, they don't have the respect. And so unfortunately, his nature isn't changing because when he is found, people pressure him too much. Um, and that's been happening for years. You know, when you find Mawati on a kill, you've just got to give him space, lots of space, one vehicle at a time. Let that build up, let him get relaxed to one, then you could bring in a second. So the person who finds the animal should be very clear about how many vehicles and all that sort of stuff. But following him on the road in the daytime, you don't even really have enough opportunity to call it in, let alone to, to get other vehicles there. But I have had a few opportunities where I've seen him and we've followed him from a distance and he's been okay. But as soon as he hears another car, He's gone. So, yeah, it's a it's a process. It's going to be a process. He doesn't like doesn't like the sounds of vehicles, and he doesn't like the pressure. After dark, though, it's amazing. It's a very different story. So when he's mating, uh, we need to put in a little bit more effort into relaxing him when he's with a female, because he doesn't care about anything in that position. But uh, some of that work has been done when he's been mating and. Then when he's not mating, he's back to being jumpy again. So it might just be his nature. He might be that one non-relaxable male leopard that we come across. It's just he doesn't want to be seen. And a bit of an introvert, I suppose. He's the big dominant male, but a bit of an introvert. Swallows on the floor here. Catherine, lovely bumbling. Nice to see swallows on the floor. They're either resting or looking for a little bit of mud. Doesn't seem to be too much mud there. Red-breasted swallow. They are breeding African into African breeding migrant. And they will use mud to make little nests underneath overhangs of buildings, tunnels. Aardvark burrows. Nice to practice uh, the swallows not moving, Cam, eh? Mm. <laughs> They're often such busy, such busy birds. Tracy, no, you don't. You don't often see many swallows on the ground. Whenever you do see a swallow on the ground, they normally add a little mud wallow, picking up mud. But um, I think these birds are probably just tired from a, a very windy, rainy night. Interesting to find them sitting on the ground like that. There's at least four of them. A 
obviously their food is aerial insects, as with most of our swallows. The very rich rufous underparts makes them very dis very very easy identified. Mosk swallow has got whitish cheeks and a throat. Harold, I wouldn't say they're the first ones migrating north. Um, swallows will be here until March, April, generally. Um, I don't know which is the first bird to leave. Um, our barn swallows are possibly some of the first to go. They've got a little bit further to go. These guys don't go all the way to Europe. They go up towards Equatorial Africa. So they don't have too far to go. Their journey is not so so cumbersome. I think it's mainly our, our European Asiatic birds that would probably leave earlier. But then I'm not sure. Most of our breeding migrants arrive at similar times. And then some of the earliest being the Warburgs in August, then the, the rest arriving in sort of September, October, November, and then most leaving by March, April. Lindapolia, well they commonly do dust bath swallows, but you know, it's, there's no dust at the moment. It's a very wet the ground. So they're doing a bit of a, they do a bit of a mud bath if they did anything. Although there's not enormous amount of mud right there. On the edge of these, these pans and, and dams is where they would get the mud. Especially the little wallows. I think they're just taking a rest. When we started our donation drive on the 28th of December, We'd hoped to raise 15,000 US dollars for critically needed technical equipment. Your generosity has seen us raise more than 50,000 US dollars from 400 amazing supporters. Needless to say, we're overwhelmed and massively grateful. Two incredible viewers, GC and Bramble One, donated 5,000 and 15,000 dollars respectively. Our profound thanks to each and every one of you.
think I think well, looking at Shadulu Shadulu is also this is a six, seven, eight, nine. So Shadulu is also nine years old, and Kuchava is also nine years old. Kuchava is also nine. So they're very much a similar age. So they're both nine years old. So that's uh, our oldest females, female leopards that we do have in the area that we do see on wild earth. There's a nice young male just staring at us, a young male impala. Snorting. Can you hear that little bit of a snort there? Did your comms is a go soft there? Uh, South Africa. Sorry, my, my communication with uh, the director just went very strange there. Uh, it doesn't look like it. I did hear just one little snort, but it doesn't look like anything serious. Maybe picked up on a scent. There is a lot of wind still around. Not as windy as earlier this uh, this morning, but there's still a bit of wind. So sometimes you'll find that uh, impalas and kudus and zero all becomes quite... <laughs> Michaela, no, if we're tracking, so there's something about uh, tracking a grass or track by scent. No, Michaela, <laughs> I don't think my, my sense of smell is so good, uh, Michaela. I don't think uh, I will put my nose down and try and track something by scent in the grass. Sometimes if it's uh, wet grass, you'll see the grass has been disturbed by something, but um, other than that, no. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's why they are snorting. I think these two other females just came out of nowhere. Female impalas and coming to join the rest of the herd. But they are looking south. I mean, I'm not just a little bit nervous. I'm just hoping we're going to get a, a chance to start moving so we can go and track quickly and see if we can get lucky. See how they're looking back, the two of them. Well, we can continue trying to track down uh, this uh, female leopard. Let's head over to Andrew. Cool. Thanks, Cedric. Yeah, we are at a, at a beautiful viewpoint now. Uh, and we're just having a good look. Apparently the elephants have just come out of the basin and they've come to the, the top section. So sort of, you know, from the ridge, that sort of area. And it sounds like they want to head towards one of the lodges. So we're just trying to see exactly where they are. And uh, maybe we get a chance to show you some elephants this morning. What a view. What a view. Just listening to all the birds that are calling. I think you might be able to hear some of them. It's a Somba green bulls and southern boo boo. And just before we went live, I heard an olive woodpecker as well.
I think it would be really cool if we can spend some time with some elephants. It is Anna Marie's birthday today. We've already seen some lions and I think it'll be so cool if we can just add to that, show you some elephants, spend some time there and celebrate one of our fellow viewers having a very special birthday today. It's not often that you, you know, you wake up in the morning and it's uh, clear skies like this. Usually there is some patches of clouds and things like that, but to have nice clear blue skies, I don't think today is going to be extremely, extremely hot, but tomorrow that's another story altogether. It's going to be about 34 degrees Celsius. It's quite a nice temperature for the Eastern Cape. Sonic, oh, that's a very difficult question to, yeah, to answer. Um, it all depends. There's so many different things. I mean, if the, if you think that the animals are stalking, you know, trying, to, if they they they're following, say, lions are following zebra, and you can tell that by the tracks, then you can look for um, the nearest group of zebra. But then also, like when animals are walking around, say, for example, we are we are tracking elephants. Sometimes uh, you can jump ahead and go look. At some water holes and things like that because you know elephants especially at the heat of the day um, or as the day is progressed and if they're walking around more than likely looking for some water especially in the afternoon so that's one of the things sometimes even getting elevated like this we're waiting for the elephants to to come out although we weren't tracking them this morning they have already been seen um, we're just trying to pinpoint exactly where they've been seen just by getting a little bit higher up It's very important to know the road network and that will definitely help you a lot with tracking. Uh, Cedric is, is very good with it and I was watching the one segment with him where he tracked a leopard and uh, he thought that the leopard was going to come out at a certain junction of a road and that's exactly where that, um, that leopard popped out. This was about six months ago. So if you know the road network very well and you can see the tracks are heading north towards this road then you can loop all the way around and then check if those tracks cross over there. And if they don't, then you know that they, they're potentially still coming. And you can narrow them down into blocks and things like that. But some of the best and funnest tracking you can do is on foot. Because that's when you really gather a lot of the information. That you could see everything that the animal had been doing uh, before the point where you found it. Are you a wildlife fanatic glued to YouTube for your daily dose of animal antics? Then welcome to Africam's wildlife community. By joining our YouTube memberships, you get no ads, just wild live streams, chat with other bush fans, get early access to exciting camera spots, and flex your wildlife knowledge with fun quizzes. Visit Africam's YouTube channel and click the join button now.
Well, welcome back everybody. We found uh, female leopard tracks coming into the property, or should I say north, from where you last saw us. We're just following up as they also seem to have gone east again, but uh, stopping to just admire the handiwork an elephant has done on this marula tree. Now obviously the marula tree uh, is fire resistant. It is grown out here in the savannah. It's a tree that has developed from an ecological point of view to survive the rigors and, and harshness of the savannah biome from the excessive heat to the fire to the insects, the wood boring insects and beetles. And the bark serves an important purpose in that. But elephants though with their tusks which are evolutionary designed, obviously males for fighting, but also females and males for gouging into the bark of trees so as to access the nutrients and the medicine that the bark, the cambium, the xylem and the phloem, the protective layer of the tree. Obviously there is a lot of dead wood inside bark, the outer dead layer, generally on the savannah trees is designed to protect it against fire. The density and thickness of the bark is designed to protect it from dehydrating and from wood boring insects getting in. But the elephant who desires nutrients, who desires medicine, is capable of damaging these trees, exposing the inner wood that we mentioned before. Sometimes this ring barking can kill a tree if it is enough if it is completely around the trunk and sometimes it doesn't kill the tree immediately but over time due to all of the elements I mentioned before the tree has been exposed and uh, yes yeah, some people might say destruction devastation but a marula tree and any other tree that dies a very natural process provides the breeding grounds for many, many organisms from insects to squirrels to birds, many of whom would not survive if it wasn't for said dead habitat trees created by elephant. And of course, though, warthogs aren't able to ring bark. Porcupines are able to. Um, normally at the base of a tree, they'll uh, damage the roots or at least the bottom uh, bark area quite close to the ground. And that also allows fire an access point. I mean, of this of this magnitude would not be at all susceptible to fire if it was in its entirety. But with the exposed wood, uh, any wood exposed to flame burns after a period of time. But uh, bark is an amazingly well suited sort of element for protecting a plant against. A fire moving through obviously incredibly hot fires have the potential to damage the canopy of a tree but if the bark is intact generally the bark takes a bit of a hit uh, but it regenerates itself after a period of time almost like a layer of skin quite an element quite an an effort was taken on this tree. That elephant would have been there for some time. The bark doesn't come off in strips, it comes off in little chunks. So that would have been a lot of effort this elephant went through. Okay, well Cedric's on the move. He had some female leopard tracks. Let's go see if he's having any luck. Thank you, Steve. You're still looking around. Yeah, I've got uh, leopard tracks coming on towards uh, the western side. Yeah, I haven't seen anything popping out on uh, Zoe's as of yet. This road that I'm on now. Um, it looks like she might have hugged a little bit that side, but we will slowly head into that area. As well as it said, there were lions in the west. I'm not too sure. I think it might have been the Kuhumas. A lion pride that they were in Hoffman's and then they moved west into another property and then they came up north and they said the lion tracks are all over all over the show 
So um, I'm just uh, crossing fingers that some of them have decided to come on to onto Juma. Uh, if that's the case, it'll be fantastic. Imagine we can get some tawny cats here. Uh, Andrew has got some tawny cats that side in Amakala. Steve got some rosettes. And uh, I think important myself, we just need our feline this uh, this morning. I am poor. Uh, I think it's about time. But yeah, I'm just going to amble down here very slowly. We're on the southwestern corner of Ajuma. Right on the southwestern corner. Mm. I think I must just, just take a look up this road. I'm, I'm going to go up here a little bit. Just want to double check on something here. Sometimes you just go with your intuition and uh, go with the, the gut feeling. Gut feeling to me is always good. Gut feeling. I'm very lucky with my gut feeling. Well, not all the time. Sometimes. Mm. All right, so you've got uh, uh, my leopard tracks going down this way. I think this might have been the same tracks that uh, uh, Steve had this morning. It might be the same one, but this is male tracks, yeah. I'm not too sure exactly where Steve picked up on his uh, leopard tracks, but uh, I know he said somewhere coming down to the fire break. Uh, I'm feeling No, Oliver, no, male won't have an issue with females in territory. Remember, the inner male, male's territory is large. So I say, I'm just going to give you like an example, a big round circle. That's a male leopard tra territory. And he's, in his territory, he'll have maybe two or three female territories, smaller territories in his territory. So, no, no, he wants um, the more the merrier. He wants to spread his genes. You know, that's the whole idea. That's, uh, you know... <laughs> He'll definitely not try and get rid of a female in your territory, you know. No, no, no. He wants to spread his genes. So. If you can have four, five, or six females in his territory, he'll be very happy. Very happy. But then you can't... But that's not going to be the case. You can't really stretch the territory so wide. Because then to really patrol and uh, protect your area is going to be way too difficult. It's like they say gonna bite off more than he can chew and that's not gonna be a good thing for for him. Yeah I got a feeling it might be the same more tracks. This uh, I think this might have been Steve coming down here. Yeah. Getting more white here. But yeah, I'm also going to just head into that area. Maybe we're lucky to we'll see what else we can find there. But yeah, we'll take a look. We'll take a look. Uh, Fiona, if a female has no offspring, who takes a territory? Fiona, if she's like, Clalamba hasn't got any offspring. But she's still territorial, so they'll still keep their territory. It's not like they're going to give their territory away because they haven't got offspring. But that's what I'm trying to understand now, with the question. No, 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 they'll still be territorial. Oh yeah, oh, uh, uh, yeah, okay, sorry, thanks Jared. Oh no, no, if the mother dies and she hasn't got offspring, well, then another female will just come into that area. It's the same as Shudulu. Now, Shudulu is not really related with any of the, um, you know, the Karula lineage or the Safari lineage and all that. But remember when Safari passed away, that's, I mean, for Safari Shadow passed away in that area. There was no other female from the Karula lineage coming in and taking over there and then Shadulu came north and she claimed that area so it can happen like that
Where did all the elephants go? No, elephants have just disappeared, huh? It'd be nice to get some elephants again somewhere. It's amazing, all of a sudden you get plenty of elephants, elephants on every single road and, and then and then all of a sudden they all disappear at once. All right, talking about elephants, I think let's head over to Andrew. I think he's also in search of those big grey mammals. Yeah, thanks, Cedric. We are searching for elephants and sorry to hear that you guys are not seeing too many elephants out at Juma. I'm sure they'll come by again there. Yeah, we're just really enjoying this nice, uh, nice view over here. It's nice and warm here. Gives us a chance to really warm up. Now, I believe uh, the elephant herd is uh, making their way to one of the lodges, perhaps, uh, for a drink of water. So we're not too far from that lodge, and I'm sure we'll come right this morning for getting some elephants. Be really nice to spend some time with them this morning. We had a good view of those lions earlier on, and I think a good view of some elephants is in store. Well, this breeze is starting to pick up now. Just wondering what this afternoon is going to be like because, uh, yeah, yesterday afternoon the wind was a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, Sir 50, that happens sometimes. Sometimes you're just minding your own business and then you encounter them like this morning. Oh man, it was so funny how we encountered them. We saw their footprints and they were so so fresh it was like they've just been put there and uh, Jared wanted to come to us and so we thought okay why not uh, do a track and sign segment because I know many of you enjoy it you know getting out the vehicle and looking at the ground and the signs of the animals and I just turned to look at the back of the vehicle to see if the lions weren't there and you know, I just I just saw that the first thing I saw was the steam coming out the mouth so I didn't know it was a lions and then I looked and I said to Morgan oh there they are and I was like, oh cool, this is gonna be this is gonna be this is gonna be lacquer. And uh, we did. We had such a cool sighting. But sometimes you do, you drive around and you're driving, driving, and the next thing boom, there's there's something specific, you know, a cheetah or a lion or elephant. You don't even really see their signs or anything, and you don't even know that they're in the area.
Welcome back live with us here everybody. Female leopard tracks are seemingly heading heading north. Someone's found them around Gary Dam, which is sort of where you'd expect, you know, towards quarantine side around camp. We didn't go into that area this morning, Cedric checked quarantine and we went around all the way on the west. But um we're gonna just slowly head up. There's a couple of little areas she likes to hang out. I'm, Strongly suspicious that it is Tlalamba. You know, very vocal last night with Cedric. Lots of energy to move. Linda Poli, you've got your patience pants on. That's fantastic. We we do as well. Mine are waterproof. Waterproof patience pants. Just having a look in that tree. What did I see? Just a tree. Always, if you have a thought, everybody, you're like, mm, I'm not sure. Just double check. Double check. You could be lucky. Many times it's been something worth investigating, and many times it hasn't been. But those times that it has been, been very well worth it. Yeah, that Cam. Doug, we see things all the time at the camp. Um, I've had Tlalamba on my porch before. I've opened, I've heard a noise on my porch, opened my curtain and the sliding door between me and her was this far. She was sitting on the porch growling at a hyena. I've had her tracks on my yoga mat before when I left it outside once. I won't do that again because um, hyenas like to eat yoga mats. I've had Shadulu walk right past me in camp. Uh, we used to have uh, Hosanna in camp. So yes, the leopards are, are not shy to walk through our camp, the very relaxed ones. Mawati tends to avoid camp if he does, it's very late at night. Um, a buffalo come through, uh, elephants, there's an elephant wire around camp, so elephants can't get in. Well, without breaking, without breaking the wire. Uh-oh. Oh no. Talking about breaking. The why this happens sometimes when I stall the car, especially going uphill. Oh, first time. Like it. Don't stall the car. I'm not so not used to a clutch anymore. But sometimes you go over these little speed bumps and the, the revs drop and then pop. Very embarrassing. Very embarrassing. So yes, we do have lots of animals come to camp. Hyenas practically move through there every single night. You can't sleep with your door open. Don't sleep with the door open. And lion have come through. They're not common coming through the camps, but uh, we've had their tracks through camp before. You know, we have bushbuck and yala that live in our camp, and uh, the leopards move through to to catch them. Also, daker. Impala don't come near camp. They are. They're way too suspicious for that. It's interesting. Nyala are very chilled. Nyala like right in our dining area and then Impala won't come near. Interesting how that works. I'm gonna check the western western edge here. What is it boys? What is it, boys? Stephen, not necessarily. I mean, hyenas, hyenas have learned to, to raid dustbins and to, to, to capitalize on, on food. Uh, but I, I wouldn't say that leopards or lions are attracted to a camp because of the food. You get certain hyenas, maybe low ranking, 
that have come across a dustbin that shouldn't have been there and there's bones or meat inside and they'll learn to associate that very quickly. The same goes for monkeys and baboons. If you do allow or leave food out, there's potential for them to become a bit of a problem. Okay, so these boys were, were having a look, but they're not looking at anything. There's a parlor in the distance are also looking. What do you see guys? They're not alarm calling, they're just they're just interested. Yeah, that's affirmative. I do believe so. Yeah, because I've got tracks now heading east as well towards your campsite and there's other tracks heading west. Okay, copy. Too. I'm going to come through the middle now. I'll come give you a hand. There's a impala over there, all looking this direction. What do you see? Lots of impala here, very relaxed. So, one of our colleagues has got uh, leopard tracks going to and from Gallego sort of area around our camp. very tricky area to to follow up on tracks everybody's having a little sleep they're all on this side Sammy definitely smells a very important part for Impala but so is their eyesight and their hearing all three are very vigilant animals But you see, predators don't often come from upwind. They come from downwind. So it's not always easy to, to pick up on the smell of a predator. And the predators are using the smell of the animals to blow towards them. So you can't smell an animal that's downwind from you. But you can see it and you can hear it. You'll often find animals will come into these open areas at night when it's windy. And they'll put their backs to the wind and they'll look into the downward side because that's where the danger will come from and they'd be able to smell if anything came from the back. So yes, their sense of smell is very acute, but uh, eyesight, a very keen eyesight and very good hearing. And Paula's running across the side. Oh my word, the sun is coming out for the first time in days and I know it's been sunny in Amakala. Let's go back over down to the sunny Eastern Cape. Uh, so happy to hear the sun is coming out and uh, you guys are warming up in Juma. Very nice, very nice. So we stopped here for a grass segment and I wanted to get out the vehicle and sit there amongst that beautiful white grass. But the light was going to be behind me and I was going to be all in the shadow. So I've gotten back onto the vehicle and we'll just have a look from the screen. Right, so this is called Natal Red Top. Also known as the scientific name Melenus Repens. Nice, easy one to remember. And it's one of the pioneer grasses that grow out in these uh, these environments. And they're ultimately, you know, very important grass if you think about it. Generally not so palatable, but it's still very, very important. And we'll explain why. So often in environments, you know, where the area has is not really established or perhaps there's been you know quite a, a big disturbance whether it be over grazing or a terrible fire and the area is disturbed then your pioneer plants start to grow and this is a common one natal red top and you can tell these pioneer plants because because of the fact that they are growing in an area that isn't very well established they need to re-establish the area you find that the seed content is very very high so those white things that you're seeing is actually the seeds, the, what do they call it now, is it the fluorescence of the grass, that's the, the scientific term, fluorescence. And at the moment it's not so red because of lack of rain, and it's now white. 
But now, when we think about it, not having such a very high leaf content, having a high seed content, uh, it means that the seeds are going to disperse and it's going to grow and grow and grow. By doing that, it's going to add organic matter to the soil. Um, the soil is going to get uh, you know, aerated from the root system of the, the grasses and then makes way for the next stage of succession of grass to come in, which is now known as a subclimax grass. Then the subclimax grass is you know, doing the same thing as the pioneer grass was doing, adding organic matter to the soil, um, aerating the soil and so on. And then makes way for the last stage and also a very important stage of succession called the, the climax grass. Now climax grasses are in areas where it's already been well established, uh, no need to establish anymore. And so those sort of grasses now have got a very leaf, a very low seed content but a very high leaf content and that becomes a very palatable grass. So often enough, if you ever think of a grass that is not eaten much by animals, it does not mean that it's a useless grass. It's a very important grass. It's starting off the area and is preparing it for the more sweeter grasses to grow and palatable grasses to grow. Nathan, I'm not sure about any alien species of grasses out at Amakala. Um, not too sure. I'm sure there will be some in South Africa. What is going on with those zebras? I just see some zebras alarming again and they're running but very far away. We'll maybe just drive there just now and just see what's going on. But you know in South Africa, Amakala, there is a few um, of the alien plants. Um, not many because Amakala has done a very good job at eradicating them. Things like thistle, uh, 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 what's the other one? Prickly pear, black wattle, and those things that were introduced into uh, the Eastern Cape environments back in the day, roughly about 200 years ago. The prickly pear was introduced as a, as a mulch, as a, as a food for cattle. They would mulch it, so mash it all up, and then they would feed that to cattle. But yeah, prickly pear, uh, yeah, really, you really can take over a game reserve if you don't actively control it. Not much of it growing out at Amakala. What I love about the the tall red top is when it's white like this it really shines so nicely in the in the sun and it, it almost looks like you know this slight little blanket of snow um, especially when it grows quite thick twenty twenty four is here and it's sure to be our best year yet. Come along and join us on the 21st of January for a company update town hall that's open to all registered viewers. We will update our viewers on where we are, discuss what's to come in the new year and answer any questions. Watch it live on the Wild Earth app. Wild Earth, connecting with nature.
Mm. Yeah, those little Red Bull Buffalo Weavers are going crazy. I think there's still so many little chicks inside there. And every time that adult gets to the nest, you just hear all the little ones chirping away for food. Can't see them, of course. They're in the middle of that big ball of uh, sticks. Not the most prettiest, the prettiest of nests. So, yeah. But oh, can you hear them? Oh, okay. I don't even know. Sorry. Uh, I was just waiting to see if we could hear them. All right, here they come. Let's listen to it. That is so amazing. I wanted, I would love to see inside of that nest. I think we were talking about it uh, the other day. We were talking about uh, it'll be quite interesting to see how it looks like in the center. Okay, so we are looking for these elephants and I've just spotted them actually. Uh, yo, Morgan, should we go down here and then get them on that side? Or do you want to view from here? Oh, it's a tough one. Yeah, let's go down this way. Okay, so we just spotted the elephants just in time. So let's uh, go and take a look at them. They're not too close, so we just need to go through this windy, windy road and then we'll get to them eventually. My goodness, there's so many animals. Porcupine, Janet, and so many different. Okay, I don't know if any of you saw, um, there's apparently some footage on social media of uh, the lion pride at Amakala trying to, not, I don't know, they were sort of just curious by his porcupines that we saw the other day. And we saw those porcupines briefly, but just before we got there, the lions were sort of having a go at the porcupines. And I saw the video footage, and thanks to Sinak for sending it to me. But uh, yeah, this porcupine would see the lions coming towards it and would face its, its quills by its tail and reverse into this, uh, this lion. And the lion backed off. Uh, I think if I was a lion, I'd be very careful with the porcupine. Okay, so there the elephants are there. Let me just go a little bit more forward. Okay, so there's a main... Yeah, I think this is our best spot. Right here, we're going to stop. Oh, uh, yay, we've got the elephants here. Yeah. What a wonderful morning. Gabby, it's always a treat. It really is always a treat. Some of the elephant sightings you have here at Amakala are profound, really profound. I think, uh, and I'm, I'm not favoring uh, the Eastern Cape Reserves and things like that, but some of the, the best elephant sightings I've ever had in my entire life have in fact been here in the Eastern Cape. Yeah, so they're definitely going to make their way towards one of the lodges. I think the guests, uh, when they're having breakfast, they're probably going to have some elephants drinking at Flossie Waterhole right in front of Flossie Lodge. That is so cool. There's a young calf walking in there. So it actually looks like they're just randomly walking through the bush there, but actually there is a, a very well-formed game trail uh, that goes right through there. And they're essentially on a game trail. And that game trail will eventually come straight over the road, almost towards us. I 
Now there's a road straight ahead of us that leads to the ridge, the top of the ridge. Um, that game trail crosses that road, so theoretically uh, they should cross the road that is directly in front of us. So we'll just see if uh, that does work or pan out. We spoke about you know knowing the road networks so that you can understand sort of where animals might be moving but also game trails are very important as well if you can learn all the the veins of the game trails in the bush well not all of them there's too many to learn but the main ones you know elephant and things like that it does help you a lot and sometimes you can just plan you can park at the close to one of the game trails and let them cross by Right, there's also a drainage line that's inside there and they'll probably go into that drainage line and there are going to be some vehicles that are going to be joining us on the sighting over here so yeah it's a it's a pretty cool day today we had some lions this morning we had some general animals we've had some um elephants as well uh, yeah you got some vivid monkeys as well okay yeah vivid monkeys oh cool Zach, that's a very good question. I think desert elephant, I, mean, I think desert elephant are very well adapted to, you know, deserts and things like that. They would struggle, maybe, not because of the hills and things, I think because of the, the general environment. But animals and elephants, they're incredibly adaptable. Um, I've actually seen in another game reserve an elephant on top of a medium-sized mountain. So these are just sand dunes that have been vegetated. This is nothing for elephants but as you mentioned there are some hills out here no elephants can climb hills not a problem at all very very adaptable animals and in some areas elephants have even adapted themselves to living in dense forest areas the forest Nisna forest elephant very seldomly seen and for many years they thought they were extinct but through photographs and game trail cameras and things like that they've managed to uh, say that yeah the Nisna forest elephants are still around but yeah, they hadn't been seen for years and years and years. People thought they were extinct. It's not the case. They're still around, just not, not being seen. I have never seen desert elephant though. Although I did work in, uh, in the Kalahari, but uh, out in that area where I worked, uh, there was no de desert elephant. Yeah, it's nice to see that, hey, Aaron? They're looking happy and healthy. It's such a nice combination to be happy and healthy. Yeah, the elephants out in Amakala, they, they, are, they are very happy. There's, there's no doubt about it. They're breeding, they're calm in nature, they're in great condition. There's plenty of space for them, plenty of uh, food for them. I think uh, if I was an elephant, I think to be in the Eastern Cape would be so nice because there's a lot of succulents that grow in the Eastern Cape. It's a nice food base for them, things like speckworm. And uh, out in Addo Elephant National Park, which is not too far from us, the elephants out there, they eat you know, most of their diet. Most of it actually consists of speckworm. And the more that they feed on it, the more that it spreads. And for anybody that has been to Addo, you'll know what I mean. You have these, these, uh, these low-growing thickets of speckworm. It's so thick that if anything goes in there, unless you knew it's in there, then you would just never know. So it seems like the rest of the group have gone in that drainage line, which is normal because the game trail does uh, go into the drainage line there and the drainage line becomes a path of itself. Okay, Steve is tracking Leopard at the moment, so let's go join him and see what's happening and how it's going.
Well, thank you, Sid, as we are trying. Uh, she came to the camp, went down, came back up to the dam. So one of our Nkoro friends is up here. They've gotten off the vehicle to just walk into the drainage line, see if maybe they can find her there. We're going to uh, try and get past the car here. Oh, haven't parked very nicely for us to get past. Guests are sometimes left on the vehicle and they get very confused. Good morning. Don't worry, your guide and tracker will be perfectly safe, eh? Hey? We'll try help from this side. Sometimes uh, you need to get off the car to find animals. Uh, I still remember a lovely story from years ago. My, my head guide at the time, Matthew Harding, and his tracker were off the vehicle, just like what's happening there. And sometimes it takes a little bit longer than you anticipate while you're off. And uh, suddenly, I don't know what, it, what happened, but we heard on the radio, hello, hello. So one of our senior guides got on the radio and said, hello, can I help you? First, like, yes, Matthew, our guide, has been gone for a very long time. <laughs> don't worry just relax I'm sure they'll be back with you shortly <laughs> and uh, they were back with him shortly but sometimes you know you, you just get you know I'd get off with my track and we'd walk in and uh, figure out something and then he'd tell me go back and go and do this go do that but sometimes just the tracks are so fresh that you're stuck way 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 and time just melts away it is a funny story hello <laughs> Make you laugh, Gab. We just saw, saw three guests on the, the back of that vehicle there and just had to reassure them. Don't worry, everything's okay. So the tracks have gone in towards the drainage line close to Vuitella Camp. Um, up and down. Came from the campsite, back up this way. Very typical of Columba if she's on the move. I mean, it might be two different cats, one coming one way, one coming the other. It's not possible that Nsumi and Tlalamba are in the same area. Nsumi seems to be spending a fair bit of her time over here. Well, the two times I've seen her. Ah, sorry, Jared. Only got the end of that. <laughs> mm. Trevor, it's a very, um, it's a very interesting one. That you know, when we, when I do bushwalks, when I take guests on trails, then yeah, we track, we find animals, we track, and there's a specific type of, of formation that we'll go in. Then you can't just have the guests and everybody walking around looking. Um, so yeah, in under specific circumstances, you can. Uh, if you've got a very small group and you're on a vehicle and you want to trail an animal, yes, we do that. It's very doable. It becomes difficult if you've got a, a large group, but it also becomes difficult if not everybody's keen. Most people don't want to get off the car. Um, that's why I love doing walking trails, because people who come on trails with me understand that we're going on a walking trail, which means that, yes, we do also have a vehicle, but for the most part, the vehicle is to get us out to areas where we can then go walk. So I love getting off a vehicle. I love tracking and I love showing people tracks. But generally, when guests are tracking with me, here's our, our friend and colleague, Ruan. Any luck there, brother? Nothing, eh? Did you check against the fence there? So nice soft sand there. Okay. We just reassured your guests that, that you guys are okay, that you're safe and sound, eh? <laughs> Enjoy. We'll check around here, but up against the fence there, there's a game path that then cuts up again. It's a really nice route. Cool. We'll let you know. Thanks, eh? So if, if guests are tracking with me, Trevor, then uh, normally 
there's a second rifle. There's me in front, second rifle, and the guests will all stand behind the second rifle, and they walk, and I go off and I do these things, but they keep walking in a single file so that they're all together as a group. You can't just have guests going out and about. It is a bit dangerous. Are you a wildlife fanatic glued to YouTube for your daily dose of animal antics? Then welcome to Africam's wildlife community. By joining our YouTube memberships, you get no ads, just wild live streams, chat with other bush fans, get early access to exciting camera spots, and flex your wildlife knowledge with fun quizzes. Visit Africam's YouTube channel and click the join button now. Never know, maybe old Clarumbo is watching this herd of, of Impala from a distance. You never know. Maybe there's some predator eyes here somewhere. And I don't know, when Steve had uh, more white as well this morning, that male leopard. That's pretty much heading into this direction, Treehouse Dam, maybe a little bit further south from where we are, but uh, I wonder if he's not going to come north. So. Well, as I just discussed, but, uh, it's not writing season, so they're not really competing as of yet. Oh, they're very nervous. There's a lot of nerves going down here. Well, I think also the wind. Typical when it's uh, a windy day, you'll find animals become quite nervous and uh, all the smells around and then as well as noises, the leaves rustling. That's uh, they do become a little bit more on edge. Uh, windy, windy days, and that's also a big reason why they're all standing so close together. You can see it there, they're not even feeding, they're actually just all just looking around. Uh, Alan, I, I think we, you know, the thing about uh, using a track like Morris in Pridelands is that uh, you know. You're going to have, I don't know, 
maybe like because of he's sitting in front there. I'm not actually too sure. I mean, I don't, we love tracking. I think tracking to, you know, I've had a tracker all my life, you know, as a guide here in the Sabi Sands. I mean, that's like 17 years with a tracker. And having no tracker now, and I mean, I, I was taught so much by my tracker, especially in Norman. I had a tracker for 10 years, one tracker. And um, he taught me a lot about tracking and uh, what you look for and, you know, just all the little tips and that. And, uh, you know, now all of a sudden when you don't have a tracker, now you're doing tracking yourself. And it's fantastic. It's beautiful. It's an art. It's actually, it is an art on uh, tracking down something. And, um, yeah, uh, I actually, I, I actually uh, me personally, I prefer it more without a tracker because... I, you know, I get involved now, you know, starts really keeping my eyes peeled for certain areas of the bush and on the road. Oh, man. Do you know, um, Paul? Oh, there's no trackers. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we are. We are the trackers. We are the trackers. So even our, even our cam-ups, some of our cam-ups are quite... Uh, queued up with uh, their tracks as well so they do help us yeah. impala. impala tracks oh, oh yeah so Paul just uh, actually found some beautiful uh, fresh impala tracks here on a big uh, clearing well done him Paul that's uh, very observant that's one thing Paul is so observant <laughs> <laughs> oh, the vultures flying above here as well. Oh, there's an elephant that's approaching. Maybe he's going to come onto this open clearing. It's just there at the bush briar. At the moment he's coming. There's an elephant that's just behind there. What do you think, and Paul? Do you think we must go a little bit forward? Yeah, I think let's go a little bit forward. Uh, let's just take a look, see if we can get this male elephant in view. This came out of nowhere. Hmm, he might be just sitting there at the bush bright at the moment. Let's go around. See if we can get a nice view up in that side. There he is. Oh, he's going to stretch up for those marula. He's like stretching there. Mm -hmm. He's looking for some uh, nice marulas. Maybe bring down the entire branch. Sometimes they'll pull down the entire branch and get to some of the nice young leaves. Pull. Pull, pull, there, ah, go. Now he's pulled himself out of frame. <laughs> oh, let's wait a bit here, yeah, he might actually come back. Looks like he wants to come back into frame. Nice, yeah, young male, not a big. School is back again, coming up onto the 22nd of uh, January, so that's every day in, on the weekdays, and that will be from 4.30 in the afternoon to 5.30 p.m. Central African time during our sunset safari. So all teachers and principals, if you've got a school or a classroom that you want to register in for the school's drive and school's registrations, Please go onto our websites, wildearth.tv, and just go onto the kids page, and then you can get all the information there and how to register your school or your class for the school drives.
Oliver, yeah, it's nice to have quite a variety in one place here yeah, with the impala wildebeest and then Oh there's an Indian miner. What is this on the on the ground there? What is the Indian miner doing here? See the bird on the ground there, Paul? Um that's in that's an invasive uh, bird species that we have here. You can see we're walking on the ground. An Indian miner. They they're not meant to be here at all. At all. Because they actually become quite a pest for our uh, indigenous birds, so of course uh, birds like uh, the starlings and that, that starts becoming a problem to them. Mm. And unfortunately yeah, we do take care of the Indian miners here, yeah, we don't like having them having, having them around here. Yeah. So that is quite interesting, having an Indian miner roaming around here. Yeah. I haven't seen one for quite some time. I remember back in the days we used to have two, a pair on Arethusa airstrip. And well, we've got the Sabi Sands to come and sort that out because, yeah, we don't want invasive species. Yeah, I know further throughout South Africa, it has become quite a, a popular a bird, but we're trying not to have them this side. When we started our donation drive on the 28th of December, we'd hoped to raise 15,000 US dollars for critically needed technical equipment. Your generosity has seen us raise more than 50,000 US dollars from 400 amazing supporters. Needless to say, we're overwhelmed and massively grateful. Two incredible viewers, GC and Bramble One, donated 5,000 and 15,000 dollars respectively. Our profound thanks to each and every one of you. Yeah, it looks like they some of them are sort of just uh, horseshoeing and coming back again but they i reckon are going to mill around this open area it's going to be nice and warm for them here as well um they've just come from the water and this is the environment in which they graze um in these open grasslands not always here they will move around because they are a roaming herd but uh these open grasslands accommodate these black wildebeest very well uh, their calves can be very vulnerable so whenever you know they feel that the, there are predators nearby which I think they do know because they can smell them um, they'll try to keep their calves as close to them as they can and then sometimes you know center them in the center of the herd and surround them the adults will surround them try and hide them in there a 
is uh, it looks like there could be two different groups here I'm not sure I don't think this is one group I think it's two different groups but they're gonna stay together Well, welcome back everybody. We don't see any predators coming from any angle right now. The tracks went into a very difficult drainage system. Uh, we were chatting with the guide and yeah, no luck. No luck. These things happen. We put in some effort. We saw a leopard this morning. Yay, even if it was just the tail end of a leopard. But uh, these drainage systems that we talk about are so instrumental for our leopards with regards to their habitat. You know, they, they've just evolved to, to blend in. They blend into the smallest amounts of cover. Now this time of year, there's so much of it that it's very, very easy to miss. Miss a cat. Even we had Mawati and he went off the road just like that we knew he was there couldn't find him so that is what they do that is their nature the most adaptable of all the big cats the last ones to leave an area they're really able to adapt even with incredible human pressure as a testament with the Cape Leopard which you find all over the Cape they've seemingly stopped calling because those that called obviously got found, as you saw yesterday, Tlala got found by Cedric primarily because she was calling. If she wasn't calling, there's no way he would have found her. So the Cape Leopard essentially has stopped calling its territory uh, because it got persecuted so heavily by man in the Cape. But there are still a number of them around, but you'd be very lucky to see them. Now Makala has them, but you'd be very, very lucky to see them down there. So much pressure was put on them that they just learned how to to stay very well hidden. Like the the Nas, the elephant, also a species persecuted down in that part of the world because of their their, their um, tendency to raid crops and to feed on on human plants, plants grown by human agriculture. And uh, they believe there's only one Nas, the elephant left. There's been some footage recently of her and she's all on her own poor dear maybe we should bring some of our elephants from Juma down there to say hello maybe the one at Cedric's with would like to go say hi Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, yeah. They, you can uh, leave our elephants alone here at uh, Juma. Thank you very much. <laughs> but we got still uh, that's a male elephant that pretty much uh, came into frame a little bit earlier there at the bush bri. And I'm hoping he, he was moving the side, but he's moving very slowly. Oh, there's some impalas running now just behind. Oh, yeah, the male's chasing the female. Run, girl, run. Yeah, he's, whoa, whoa. Oh, what camera work. And Paul, you are amazing. Look at that. Now uh, he's just trying to hurt her, making sure that she's not going to be out of line and get back into the harem. There we go. That was wonderful. And there you go. Hmm. Back to the herd. Wonderful, great, great camera work there, and Paul. I mean, we definitely got some very skilled cam ops here at Wild Earth. Most of them, except in Paul. <laughs> oh, just kidding. <coughs> no, no, we've got fantastic cam ops.
right, see this uh, male elephant is just still enjoying all these little fruits, all little marula fruits that's lying on the ground. Lovely time of the year for them. We'll go from one tree to the next tree to the next tree. William, um, I have uh, seen it before, once or twice, not often, but I have seen them go onto the back legs when they're actually stretching up to try and, and get a little bit more height to bring down a branch from a tree. So I've had seen, seen that, but as I say, usually what they'll do is now with the marulas, instead of doing that, they'll actually just shake the tree and force the little marula fruits to come tumbling down onto the ground and then they can pop them in like uh, M&M's. You can see he's enjoying it. Sn snipping around the tree, picking up on the sweet fruits. I won't be surprised if this male ends up there at Gary Dam this morning. Dam that's just to the east of our camp. At least the wind has started dying down a bit. Starting to get much lighter. Some little bit of blue skies some in certain places. So I think this afternoon it's going to be a nice warm afternoon. I think the humidity might climb a bit today. Bears. Bears, eh? It must be bears. She bears. Bears or she bears? But they are she bears or she bears? Yes, you must welcome. Oh, babs, babs, kebabs. I like kebabs. I don't count. Babs. Yes, no, it's been a wonderful, wonderful morning. A nice uh, uh, Steve O's got uh, more whitey than male leopard. And uh, Andrew down there in Amakala with the uh, lions for the morning. Good way to start the Feline Friday. And a good way to end this uh, sunrise safari with this beautiful male elephant that is just wandering around here on the big open clearing. Having his breakfast. I'm talking about breakfast. I think Paul can't wait for his. Yeah. I can't. I think we all can't wait for a good old breakfast, a nice hearty breakfast this morning. Perfectos. Ernie, yes, uh, it is nice that I'm getting along with some of the elephants. I think, uh, I think, uh, I think Steve-O uh, spoke to most of the elephants around here on uh, Juma uh, the other day and told them, please uh, make sure that you do behave yourself. Make sure that you look after Cedric and don't go for him. Let him be. He's already had a few heart attacks over the last couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, thanks, Steve. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, thanks so much for all the comments and questions. I really do appreciate. It. Thanks for joining us on our sunrise safari. And well, we are going to just end off with this beautiful open clearing with a young male elephant that is busy feeding around here and please make sure to join us this afternoon on our sunset safari it's going to be magic it's going to be wonderful from the wild earth team from this elephant paul and myself have a lovely day further goodbye